as I mentioned right at the start, we're in the middle of a series. It's called uh, Revolution, and it's a teaching series through the book of Acts. And why we decided to have a look at the book of Acts uh, in this particular season is that, you know, as we are in this process of regathering, you know, so often we find ourselves dealing with the day-to-day reality of COVID. And look, that's hitting really hard on days like today. I know a number of families who are out just, you know, they're isolating at home, and they've just they've just got COVID. And, but... Part of that can be is we kind of we, we can we can have all these things really close up and in our minds and we have to deal with them properly and rightly. But one of the things about perspective is that you know when things are so close, we miss the background. We can miss the bigger thing uh, that's going on as we deal with the day-to-day realities of um, these very important moments. And what I wanted to do in this series is to give us a fresh vision or to lift the horizon sights of our hearts and minds back into actually what is Jesus doing? What is Jesus up to in the world uh, today? And so we're into the series um, from the book of Acts. And if you haven't, Acts, the book of Acts is part two of a, um, a two-part volume that was written by uh, the Apostle Luke. So in, in Luke's gospel, it's about what Jesus began to do. And in Acts, the second volume, is what Jesus continues uh, to do through uh, his own personal work. And particularly, um, what we're going to hear about today is through the person and work of the Holy Spirit. It's Pentecost Sunday. That's where we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. But also, not only just for the church as a historic thing, but the importance of that for our day-to-day lives. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have Peter come and uh, read to us. So Peter, come on down. And then after that, uh, Mary's going to preach. Now, it's one thing to have four children, right? That's a thing. Anyone here has got four children? Yeah, all those who have got four children, they know it's a thing. But to have four children and preach, that's quite a thing, isn't it? It's amazing. So in a moment, Mary's going to come, but now we've got Peter. Thank you. So the reading today is uh, Acts 2, 1 to 6, and 14 to 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, And at this sound, the crowd gathered and and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native tongue of each. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, Signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And together we pray. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Winter is over. The hope of spring is breaking through. New creation in the midst of the old. Renewal has begun. The breath of the Spirit carries the seeds of the Gospel. 
Jesus has overcome death. The same resurrection power alive in Jesus is alive in you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Step out with Jesus. Revolution has begun. Good morning, everybody. It's great. I'm going to get rid of this. Sorry. It's great to be here this Pentecost morning. Um, hello to everybody who is um, joining us online or listening on the podcast. My name is Mary, and I'm one of the leaders here at St. Augustine's. Back in December in 2016, I was part of a girls' group with some of my closest friends. One week, we were given a homework task to write an unlimited amount of dreams, the things we desired most in our hearts. That, you would think, would be an exciting task, but for me, it definitely was not. Surprisingly, it really triggered something in me, something to the point of anger. Something that was meant to be fun and inspiring filled me with dread, and my brain was blank. I couldn't think of anything to write, because for me, to write down my dreams was to write down a whole list of failures, the things in life that I hadn't achieved. And dreaming is hard because it is vulnerable. All those things we've hoped for, things are being, um, they're being exposed if we actually put them into writing or if we share them with other people. And in today's consumerist and individualistic society, we have drummed into us that we should always follow our dreams. We should always pursue our passions, always turn, reality, uh, turn into reality what we believe will make us happy. This is driven through advertising and marketing, through movies that show us the dream of true romance and happily ever after endings. So many Disney movies follow the mantra of follow your dreams, which is all well and good, but what if our dreams are directed towards something that won't really give us actual fulfillment? Jim Carrey, the successful actor, said, I hope everyone could get rich and famous and have everything they've ever dreamed of so they will know that it is not the answer. Our dreams can often center around ourselves rather than on people, other people, or on God. And what if what we dream up for our own lives isn't a firm foundation of the abundant life that God has for us? What are we left with then? For me, though, I hadn't even got as far as Jim Carrey of achieving all my dreams. When confronted with the prospect of having them written down on paper, my failed attempts left me with a deluge of disappointment. All the things that had been dreamed in, so, dreams in so many areas of my life had turned into nothing and I felt like an absolute failure. And yet a few weeks later, after being really upset about the whole task, I had a little uneventful prey and I couldn't stop writing. Suddenly my dreams became a whole lot less about me and a whole lot more about God and his dreams for my life. You'll see, oh gosh, that's my, I, I purposely zoned that out so you couldn't read them all, but you can still see them. It's vulnerable putting your dreams up there. Switch the slide. Uh, preparing, for, <laughs> preparing for this talk, I really felt that God was saying that he wanted to reignite our God-given passions and dreams. And I believe that God is knocking on the door of those dreams and wanting to recreate, reconnect with us. But how does God do this? What is the only way he does this? through the revolutionary power of the Holy Spirit. He wants to give us excitement and renew our faith so that we can live out the dreams that God has given us to further his kingdom. And God in Acts describes just that. In the last days, it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. In the Christian tradition, Pentecost brings the 50-day Easter season to a close, but it also points towards new beginnings. For it's when Christians celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit and the new horizons, that, and the new horizons this opens in the story of God's commitment to the world. When, as we've just read in Acts, the description of the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit falling upon Jesus' followers, dreams and visionary experiences are part of the discussion. But these details make many of us nervous. But they should also make us expectant, eager to play a part in the emergence of God's hopes and dreams for us and for those around us and for the wider world. 
But to be able to live out these God-given dreams, we need to be, have a living relationship and be in communication with God. We need to be seeking God, and we do this through the Holy Spirit. Because Pentecost is about God coming as close to us as possible. It's a love story. God is love, and we are the objects of his love. Pentecost is where God gives both his power and his vision of his dream for humanity and his creation. And revolution happens when our dreams and God's dreams are aligned through the power of the Holy Spirit. God reveals his son to us by his spirit, and then he uses us to reveal God the son to other people. God empowers us by his spirit, and then we're to give away what we've received to empower and bring healing to and transform the lives of others. So, are we doing that? Are we asking the Holy Spirit into our hearts for God to use us? Do we remember those dreams that God has placed in us? Do we have those visions? The Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, and it continues to be right now, this very day. But in this time of COVID, it's been a time where life has been on pause. Maybe even our faith has been on pause, or maybe we've even struggled to feel close to God. Because our spiritual life can easily get disrupted. It gets disrupted by our work life. It gets disrupted by family life. It's been disrupted over these past two years by us not being able to meet together at church or not being able to be inspired and connected with one another. It can be disrupted by disappointment, by grief, by sadness by the loss of what we wished would come into fruition, but hasn't. But I believe that God wants to take whatever faith you have, because he says he'll take faith as small as a mustard seed, and he wants you to trust him, to allow the Holy Spirit into all areas of your life. Because God wants to use you. He wants the dreams that he has birthed in you to become reality. Because God's power can revolutionize our lives and the lives of others. But there, is, there will be no God revolutions without the Holy Spirit. Jesus did nothing until the Holy Spirit came on him as he was baptized in Matthew 3.16. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens opened to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And these disciples were instructed to do nothing without the Holy Spirit. Nothing happens without the Holy Spirit. But so often, we let fear and our sense of wanting to be in control get in the way of surrendering, surrendering and submitting our lives and dreams to God. If we are honest, how many of us are fearful as to what happens if we do fully surrender to God? What happens if we let go of our dreams and focus solely on the dreams that we know God has for our lives? Because sometimes they don't align, and that can be really hard. Or how many of us are fearful of what might happen if we really invite the Holy Spirit into our lives? If we go forward for prayer on a Sunday, maybe we're worried about what will happen or what others will think. But going forward for prayer is just saying, God, I fancy a chat and I want to hear from you. It is not, I'm in a vulnerable state and an emotional mess. But even if we are in a vulnerable state and an emotional mess, don't we want to get healing in that? And who can heal, comfort, and love like no other? God can, through his Holy Spirit. Receiving prayer at the front is not a big deal. And we want to make it as normal as coming up for communion. Because as a Christian, it is normal to want to talk and to hear from God. The first experience you had at church will have likely defined what you think Christianity, church is actually like, and in turn, therefore, what God is actually like. And I know amongst my friends, early experiences of the Holy Spirit ministry in churches has created a negative and untrusting experience of God. Couple that with Kiwi culture, where being vulnerable definitely is not a good thing, and receiving prayer could possibly create an emotional release. It seems it should be avoided at all costs. But I'm here to say that that is a load of rubbish. Because as a Christian, we cannot do anything without the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we have to trust God that God is for us and not against us. And we know that's true because it says so time and time again in the Bible. As a lot of you know, because I have said it so many, many times, I wouldn't be standing here today if I hadn't gone forward for prayer each week at my home church in London with tears and snot pouring down my face. 
When I said yes to God and allowed the Holy Spirit into my life, it was transformed miraculously. But I would highly recommend not getting to the point of desperation that I was in to ask the Holy Spirit into it. I tried to carry on doing things my way. I tried pursuing my dreams without the Holy Spirit, but those dreams were all just about me. But when God came back into my life, I viewed my life through a lens given to me by the Holy Spirit. And so my dreams changed without me even realizing it. And yes, I did feel disappointment at the way things had worked out. But there was a whole lot more peace than I'd ever had before. Some people spend their whole lives pursuing empty dreams. But when you partner with the Spirit and act in God's dreams for the world, you don't have to worry. Because when you're partnering with the Eternal, you're partnering for the Eternal. But the Holy Spirit doesn't always cause crying and snot face like I had. And so going back to my Methodist roots, because I am a Methodist minister's daughter, uh, I want to mention two great men who had a dramatic impact on society today. Firstly, I've mentioned him before, the great John Wesley, who in 1738 at a Moravian Bible study in London said, I felt my heart strangely warmed. And from that gentle experience of the Holy Spirit, birthed the Methodist movement, which reformed British society, averted a civil war, started a mass revival, and ultimately, through Wesley's disciple Wilberforce, would criminalize the slave trade throughout the British Empire. From that one gentle experience of the Holy Spirit. And of course, another Methodist, William Booth, who along with his wife Catherine started the Salvation Army, said, I will tell you the secret. God has had all there was of me. There have been men with greater brains than I, even with greater opportunities. But from the day I got the poor of London on my heart and caught a vision of what Jesus Christ could do with me and them, on that day I made up my mind that God should have all of William Booth there was. And if there is anything, anything of power in the Salvation Army, it is because God has had all the adoration of my heart, all the power of my will, and all the influence of my life. These two great men encountered the Holy Spirit, said yes to God, and then their lives of, the lives of others were immeasurably changed. If God can use them, why can't he use you or me to also achieve, achieve such revolutionary dreams? He can. And look at the disciples. It's so easy to forget that before they met Jesus, they were just your average Joe. We take their faith for granted, but they only gradually came to believe. It wasn't easy for them to believe that Jesus was fully divine or fully human. They were living their lives with him and witnessing all the miracles, and yet they still failed Jesus. James and John were known as the sons of thunder because of their aggressiveness. Judas betrayed Jesus. Thomas doubted Jesus. And Peter denied Jesus three times. I hope you all know this, but just to remind you, we do not have to be super spiritual or perfect for God to use or speak through us. He will use us wherever we're at with whatever we have to offer him. Mike Pilavacci, amazing UK preacher, said, The Holy Spirit was not sent so we could have bless-ups in our churches, but so the world can be changed. Yes, the Holy Spirit can make us feel great and do incredible and transformative and healing power and our healing work in our broken lives. But then he wants us to share those stories to go and change the world. The disciples received the Holy Spirit in such a transformative way that they couldn't do anything but go speak of the incredible work and blessing that God had poured down upon them. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other language as the Spirit gave them ability. And God wants to use us just as powerfully as he used the disciples. And so to be able to partner alongside God in our dreaming, we need to be inspired and believe that those dreams can be possible. But how does that happen? It happens through hearing and experiencing the stories of God in our lives and in the lives of others, which is why it's always so encouraging to hear stories when we share them on a Sunday with each other. It's a moment of seeing heaven and earth collide and realizing the impossibilities of our life when we let God into them. And we all have these stories, otherwise we wouldn't have a faith in God. Something moved us from unbelief to belief. 
And sometimes we need to remind ourselves of those faith stories, to remember the seeds that God has sown into our lives so that we can reignite those dreams and be used for God's glory. When we think of God downloading his dreams for creation to us, we can so often think it happens in a a dramatic road to Damascus type of way. But so often, the way we align our dreams with God happens in slow and uneventful ways. But how do we know when it's God? I want to tell you about my friend Robin. This is Robin. It's about a beautiful face there. I know Robin from my old church in London. And in the summer of 2018, um, Robin started volunteering at a food bank. He saw that they often had um, too much of some supplies and not enough of others. On top of this, the traditional way of giving to food banks, of delivering food to a supermarket or the like, was time-consuming and inefficient. And this frustrated Robin. So on the 6th of October that year, as he was walking down the road, he recorded a voice note to himself saying, why isn't there an easier way to give to a food bank online? Earlier in that year, he'd been involved in a near-fatal cycling accident in the Alps, and as a result of that made him think, what am I about and what am I doing? So when the idea came to mind about the food bank issue, he recognized it as something that he really wanted to act upon. The seed was sown, and as a result of this, he developed Banquet. Banquet allows people to donate to any UK-registered food bank on their website. Each week, food banks can request supplies through Banquet's online system. They then arrange for these supplies to be brought with the donations given. Food isn't wasted, and there is an easy way to donate. Simple, yet effective. The first pilot took place in July 2019, and eight months later, COVID hit. When interviewed recently for the Church Times, Robin said... When I started Banquet, I prayed a very simple prayer, which was, God, would you use me for your glory? That's it. I couldn't have known eight months later, after the launch, we'd be scaling up in the middle of a pandemic. But I dedicated this project to God. I don't know where this is going to end up, but I trust you and will keep pursuing it if you want me to. He continued, Banquet proved that if we work together, then many things are possible. We really can move the dial and make an impact. My faith gives me ultimate hope. God's in the business of making all things new all the time. We just need to bump, jump on it and do our bit. And we need to hope because without hope, we can't dream. Now that dream has grown, <coughs> excuse me, and Robin is doing amazing things and, this hu- and has huge dreams to develop Banquet on a much larger scale. But initially it started with simply witnessing a problem and then being inspired to come up with a solution. But what about the little things or those drops in the ocean that we don't even know the ripple effect of? I was going through my talk with Matt Maslin and he told a story of when he was around 12 years old. This is, I basically went to his Facebook and found the oldest pictures I could find. His youth pastor led the youth group in an exercise where they prayerfully considered what might be their life mission statement. The word spoken over him by his youth pastor was that he was gonna be someone to teach truth. Matt didn't think much of it at the time, but in various moments in his life, he's seen how to teach truth was God's dream for his life. And as Matt has partnered with God in that dream, he has seen it come into fruition in various parts of his professional and personal life in a way that has brought him and others life. God puts dreams in our, heart, in our minds and they can start almost as a niggle, something that won't go away. And I'm sure there will be some of you as I speak where something has come to mind via the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's a person who God wants you to speak to. Maybe it's an idea that you've had. Maybe it seemed an impossibility. But I would encourage you not to put those dreams aside, not to think, oh, it seems ridiculous. I would encourage you to share it, maybe with just one other person or to write it down because there is power in the process of admitting and declaring our dreams and having others witness it of being true to the core of our hearts and bringing it before God for his will to unfold. When we allow God to do his work in us, when we allow the Holy Spirit into our lives, when we give up control of our lives and our dreams and surrender them to God, it can have incredible and revolutionary results. The disciples were just normal people like you and me, but God used them with all their weaknesses and failings and they went on to birth the church. My friend Robin is just like you and me. He had an idea, and that idea is having a major impact in providing food for those in need. 
God used Matt's youth work, youth pastor, who listened and acted on God's word. And we are fortunate enough here at St. Augustine's to have that word be lived out into fruition. We have a generation of young people in our society and here at St. Augustine's who need God's truth and love sown into their lives, who need inspiration for their dreams. We have a city and a country who need to hear about the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Everyone sitting here now or tuning in online, I'd love you to remind yourselves why you call yourself a Christian. If you're not a Christian, I would say to you that God would love to be in relationship with you. What are those stories that lit a flame to your faith? What are those dreams that God has placed on your heart to further his kingdom? Don't ever think that those God dreams are not possible because it says in the Bible, with God, all things are possible. We need to share these dreams and God stories to inspire our kids and the youth, our friends and family who don't know God, because that is how the love of God is spread. That is how the early church was birthed, through God pouring out his Holy Spirit and the effects of that being witnessed and shared to others. Because when the Holy Spirit moves in our lives, it is something worth sharing. You may think you're not spiritual enough, you're not perfect enough, you're not worthy enough. And yes, that's true because we are all broken humans. Yet God wants, still wants to use us and use you to bring his kingdom in heaven down to earth. He wants to use you to share the good news of the transformative power of the Holy Spirit in your life, just as he used his disciples. You are no different to them. But as I've said, this is only possible by allowing the Holy Spirit into our lives. And all we have to say is, Holy Spirit, come. We only have to ask God to send his Holy Spirit. And just as the Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit will be and is with us here now and always. For it says in Luke 11, how much will the Father give his Spirit to those who ask? I found this brilliant quote quote on Pentecost and our dreams by a guy called Matt Skinner, who's a professor in New Testament in the States. It's a long one, but it's too good not to share, and Matt said I could say it all. Um, Pentecost is an invitation to dream. For when a community of faith quits dreaming dreams, it has little to offer either its members or the wider world. Like any good dream, these dreams involve adopting a new perspective on what's possible rousing our creativity to free us from conventional expectations. They help us to see that maybe what we thought was outlandish actually lies within reach. Maybe I can find freedom from what binds me. Maybe there can be justice. Maybe I can make a difference. Maybe a person's value isn't determined by their income. Maybe the future of our economy or our society or our planet is not yet determined. Maybe God is here with me even if my current struggles never go away. The Christian faith has its roster of exceptional dreamers who, like Jesus, insisted that God could make possible the things that other people couldn't see. The last century gave us people like Martin Luther King Jr. and so many others, but dreams need not always be dramatic. And the prophetic task of describing how a new God-given possibility is coming to life is not restricted to a public figure with magnetic personalities. Remember, according to Acts 2, God promises the spirit to all flesh. It belongs to a whole community. And even when this community's dreams are smaller, more localized, or slower to develop, they can still be revolutionary. Christians will look back in time on Pentecost as they should, but they'll also need to be looking at the present, dreaming with their eyes open, and daring to consider where God may be found today. And so I invite you today to open up your eyes and to seek out the Holy Spirit in your hearts and lives. To create more God's stories in the lives of others through the stories God has created for you. So that we can dream big revolutionary dreams and become people of Pentecost for today and for the generations that will follow after. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you that it is as simple as asking you to come. We thank you that you promised to never leave us by sending your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we just ask that today that you would come and reignite those dreams. 
that you would birth in us new stories to bear witness to others of the amazing and transformative power that you can bring through your Holy Spirit. Father, let us be encouraged that you want to use each and every single one of us. Lord, these dreams are not for other people. You want to use each and every one of us. God, you are a God who can transform, who can bring healing, who can change the world if we say yes to you. And Father, I just pray that you would be lighting the flame in every person's hearts right now. That you would be inspiring and breathing your Holy Spirit into ideas and dreams that maybe we thought just couldn't be possible. Lord, for those whose... Um, maybe feeling disappointment at, at dreams that haven't gone your way. Lord, I just pray you would come and speak into those. Bring peace, bring healing. But just let your light shine the way. May your Holy Spirit guide us. Amen.